You know, this morning I know it's been difficult, and I just want to say that when trouble arises, a lot of people take a look at a situation, take a step back, but leaders take a step forward, and that's exactly what our missions committee and elders have done. And so in addition uh, to praying for the children and staff uh, down there in Ecuador, I ask that you lift up our, our shepherds and our missions committee as they chart a, a new path forward. Obviously, we need to double down on our efforts and what we're doing there. We're in our second week of of a stewardship series, and I hope that you have spent some time in, in the book that we passed out a couple weeks ago uh, with your family and have begun some of those conversations. As we begin this morning, and I, I need some help, and so I've, I've asked for three um, of our kids from the kids program to come up, so I'm going to ask them to come up and, and help us out with a little illustration and so here's what you guys, you guys, come on up, come on up here. And I want you to stand here behind the, the table. So we'll have Grant, we'll have you, you stand right here. I want you to come on down here, down here, and we'll have Scout here in the middle. Okay, guys, what, what we're going to do is I'm going to read a, a situation, and you guys are going to have to make a decision and choose one of these three scoops. Okay, so I just kind of first reaction, whatever goes on, so... First, we have Grant Kaufman, and he is uh, Daniel and Tatum's son. And, and Grant, here's your situation. A new kid comes to school and, and shows up in your classroom, and uh, he may be trouble. He has, uh, his hair is all messed up, and his shirt is, is kind of stained and dirty, and he has a frown on his face. Should you spend a whole lot of time with him, should you spend maybe a little bit of time with him or avoid him altogether? Could be trouble. Which one are you going to do? Why don't you pick one of the scoops here? Figure out what you want to do. All right? So you're going to play it safe and, and, and go with the spend a little bit of time with him. All right. Next, we have Scout Stewart. Come, you go, go ahead and hold on to it because that, that's your choice. And she is Dave and Tracy's daughter. And Scout, here's your situation. You're out playing with some of your friends in the neighborhood, and an older girl comes down and accidentally pushes you into a mud puddle. Okay? The next day, she accidentally pushes you back in the same puddle. Are you going to say, that's okay, I know you didn't mean to, or it's okay, but it better not happen again, or do you reach up and grab her by the shirt and pull her in the same mud puddle? Okay. So figure out which one you want to do. Can you make your selection here, Scout? Oh, it's tough. Pick, pick one of them here. All right, playing for the same. Okay, all right. Now, the, second, the, the last one here it is a very difficult situation as well for you, Tyler. And Tyler is the son of Sean and Jackie Kelly. And, and, and Tyler, here's your situation. It's your birthday, and you've got a whole bunch of brand new toys and after the party, your sister, Caitlin, wants to play with them. Now, are you going to let her play with all of your new toys? Some are your new toys, or are you going to hide your new toys? Which one is it going to be? They're brand new. Which way do you want to go? Make a choice. All right, playing it safe. All right, just some of them, just some of them. Well, I have to tell you that Grant, uh, as Mr. Steve was, was reading this morning, in Luke chapter 6 and verse 37, Jesus says that the size scoop or measure that we use when it comes to offering up uh, grace and, and acceptance, that's the size scoop he's going to use for us. And, Scout, when it comes to forgiveness, the size scoop that we choose is the size that he's going to use to sprinkle over us when we do things we're not supposed to. And what do you think? We got this last scoop, and Jesus talks about that when we're going through and uh, the measure that we choose for what we give is also the measure he's going to use to give for us. So I've got over here a representation of, of God's generosity and His forgiveness and also His grace. So I'm going to let you guys scoop with the, 
does anyone want to change the size group that they chose? Does anyone want to change your scoop? We're, we're, we are a grace-filled church. So I'll let you change your scoop size if you'd like to, to get you some of this. All right, go ahead and dig in here. Okay, it says fill it up to the rim. There, and it says, it says uh, shake it down. He said press it down, let it overflow here. Scout, you're, you're going to stay with that? You want to go with the bigger one? Okay, all right, we'll, we'll put a few in here. Here, here we go. All right, yeah, all right. In, in, in fact, okay, so, so shake it down and, and press it. And in fact, uh, why don't we do this in, instead? Put, put your thing down, and I'm, I want you to hold up, hold open your, your shirt like this. Just so hold it up big, because he said it's going to overflow into your lap. So we've got to give lots here. So Scout, do you want to lift, lift up? Yeah, okay, so pour that in. And we're just going to get tons of it because he said it's just going to overflow. All right, so you're, you're ready to go. All right. All right. So let, let's give him a hand. So good job, kids. Head on down. Yeah, head, head, head on back. Yeah, there you go. You, you can keep the scoop if you want to. We have to decide what size scoop we want to use Luke chapter 6 and verse 38 says for the measure that we use it will be measured unto you Jesus is not preaching health and wealth here what he's talking about with his disciples is he wants a larger part of their heart he wants us to be so connected with him and so connected with his heavenly father that we choose the largest scoop that we choose to have God more a part of our life, not less a part of our life, and to be totally consumed with Him. And whatever size scoop that we choose, it says that He presses down, He shakes it around, He lets it overflow and spill out over into our laps. That's what God wants us to do. So we have to decide this morning what size scoop we want to choose. Well, how do we, how do we choose that? Well, we, we talked about how we decide a little bit last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. It said, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so for those that weren't here last week, we talked about some of the different motivations uh, for, for giving to the church. And the, the first is, is kind of the lowest level, and that's guilt or we have to giving. And that's where we're, we're under some type of duress, and, and hopefully that, that is not how you feel here at this congregation. The, but the, the second level is responsibility. And it's kind of your duty, or ought to giving. And so we know that there are things that need to be done, and, and that there are some type of expectations. And so you, you write that check, and because you, you feel like, man, I, I've got to live up, and, and our family's going here, The next level is a little bit deeper, and that's giving to a need or want to giving. And so you hear about something, and it it, it works on your heart, and so you're like, I want to respond to that. And the final level of giving that we talked about last week is worship. We're so consumed with God. We're so consumed in in understanding what He's done for us on on the cross that we celebrate in, in our time of communion that it just overflows. And so it's our response, and it's giving Him all that we have and all that we are. Well, that final one is, is what we're shooting for, but I imagine there are some that are like me this morning that want some type of a practical guide. You know, how, how do you move in, uh, in your mind tangibly from this ought to giving to, to this giving as, as, as a response to worship? How do we do that? Well, I think we need to go to Scripture and take a look at that and Steve is kind of introduces some of these ideas in our communion of thought this morning. But the standard of giving that's constantly mentioned within Scripture is what my buddy Scott Franks calls first in ten giving. Giving God, giving to Him first, and secondly, giving Him a tenth. Well, giving to God first means that we make our contribution to His church first and then everything else lines up after that in, in our finances. And it, it's the same with our priorities. That, that God, people should be able to tell by, by how we're setting up our, our life and, and our, our time commitments. And all these things, 
that God comes first. And not only should people on the outside be able to see that, but our, our children should as well. And so we give God first, and then everything else comes after that. And the, the wisdom behind that is, is pretty simple. That we're moving God to the front of the line. And we're making sure that the thing that we claim is the most important is represented in all that we do. And we're putting Him in slot number one. Well, giving God first means giving Him the first fruits and also the firstborn. And that was kind of a central tenet that we saw in the, in the Old Testament Mosaic Law. Exodus 22 and verse 29 says, You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me, and you shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. So the, the Bible states here that giving to God it is first. It's, it's like the on button. It's a starting point. It's the ignition switch, ignition switch that, that we flip because when we give in this way, God starts other blessings that start coming in as our heart begins to grow and our faith deepens in Him. Proverbs 3 and verse 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits." of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. So Jesus taught kind of the the same principle when he's talking out out on on the Sermon on the Mount. And and he's talking about if you're following after me and if you're you're trusting in your Heavenly Father, he said you're not going to be consumed with what you're wearing. You're not going to be consumed with what you're eating and what you're drinking. That God knows your needs. God cares for it as He cares for for the lilies of of the field and the birds of the air. He knows what you need. He's going to provide for you. He's going to take care of us. So first in ten giving, we give God and to Him first. Now let's let's talk a little bit about the ten. Well, the ten means giving to God the first tenth of what we receive or earn. And that's called tithing. And tithe means a tenth. So when God gave, gave Moses the, the guidelines of, of how the nation of Israel, after he has already delivered them from Egypt, he brings them over and he says, this is the guidelines that I would like for, for my people to live as a holy nation before me. And he, he set up the, the tenth as kind of a standard so that you know, whether you make a, a, a huge amount or a small amount, you're all giving a proportion of what God has blessed you with. And this went to the needs of, of the priests as an offering and an, as an act of worship. And if you read throughout all the practices that we see within Mosaic Law, they actually gave well beyond this. It was uh, upwards of, of over 20% and closer to 30%. So this was just a portion. This was a starting place. And so this tithe is where God said that your giving should start. In Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30, it says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether it's grain from the soil, fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord, and it's holy to the Lord. It's set apart. It's special. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's raw will be called out and set aside as holy to the Lord. Wait. I know what you're, you're kind of thinking. Hold the bus. That was Mosaic Law that we're, we're talking about. That's Old Testament. <laughs> we are so far beyond that. You know, we're no longer under the Mosaic Law that, and, and the commands that were passed down there. But if you read in, in Hebrews chapter 7, and verses 1 and 2, it, it talks about how that Abraham, the man that, that begun it all, and, and God commissioned him to lead this holy people. It said that he gave a, a tenth of all that he had and, and the spoils that, that God had given him from his various victories to Melchizedek the priest. And then we also see in Genesis chapter 28 and verse 22 that we've got Jacob. And you remember as, as he's fleeing when Esau is wanting to kill him and he's going to visit his, his father-in-law Laban. He's dirt poor. He has no possessions, just the coat on his back and maybe a knapsack full of food. And as he's out there, he, he falls asleep on the rock and he, he sees the vision of, of the ladder with the angels descending and, and going up and down. And he wakes up the next morning and says, God, you've been in this place and I know that you're with me. And if you'll bless me, whatever you give me from this point forward, because he has nothing now, he said, I will set apart a tenth. 
And both of these actions that we see recorded in Scripture happened before the law that was given at Sinai. And certainly within the Gospels, Jesus seems to teach this a good practice as well. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, he's there at the Pharisee's house. and He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, which are justice and mercy and faith. It is these that you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. So Jesus is not teaching against tithing. He says, keep it up. But he said, just because you're doing this, that's great. But he said, don't neglect the bigger picture, which is offering justice and, and, and mercy and showing faith in all that you do, including in your giving. And yes, again, he, he's speaking to Jews that were under the Mosaic law. But you know, I don't see anything in the New Testament that encourages us to dial back and, and with, with God's people that is somehow less of a response to God on this side of the cross. As Steve talked about, if anything, it should be over and above what was expected before the, the death and sacrifice of Jesus. You know, if, if I'm looking for a standard in Scripture, uh, the consistent scoop that gets picked up is, is this first and ten giving. And I, I think that there's a real timeless benefit to this level of giving. And I, I got to thinking, why is it that, that God set this limit? And I, I think a tithe is, is a point where it starts getting a little serious. It, it's a big enough amount that it kind of gets your attention. It, it's also a, a big enough amount that it causes you to kind of restructure some things, to pay attention to your money and, and to kind of say, what are my priorities? And, and, and to take a look at things. So it's, it's a substantial amount. And for some people, it's an un comfortable amount and a lot of people say well I I just don't have 10% to give uh, you know there, there's just not a, a an extra 10% lying around at, at the end of the month that I could give to the church it's just not there you know man we, we would if we had it we, we'd give it we just don't have it but you know I'm sure that that makes sense on a balance sheet but God never asked his people to give an extra 10% after what they had he says Give to me first. Take to me your first offering. When, when the crop is out there in the field and you don't know if, if lightning is, is going to strike as you're harvesting, you, you've got 10% in. Give that to me first. Not wait and see. and we'll, we'll see how this all plays out. Then if we've got some left over, he says, no, bring to me first. Bring to me that, that choice lamb. Not, not the, the run to the litter. Pick the best one. And, and not to say, well, let's see if all of, of, of the lamb from, from this year make it, and then if all of them make it as we have uh, scheduled, then we'll give. No, he said, the first one that comes out, the perfect one given to me. That's what he's calling us to do. But, you know, sometimes that, that's, that's difficult to do. When Jill and I were first married, uh, I've shared this before, uh, we were we were basically living on ramen noodles. Um, she was a first-year school teacher, and she was making more than, than I was, and she brought that up from time to time. She was bringing home the bacon, and I, I was working for a church as an intern, and uh, they didn't pay squat. And so we, we were just surviving. And we're also, uh, we had learned from other people that you don't get a real expensive apartment because if you get a real expensive apartment, it's harder to save money and also desire to get out. So my plan was to get a, um, uh, well, let's just say it was the cheapest apartment I could find. It wasn't in the best part of town. So that was an incentive for us to save money for a house. We're saving money for a house. We're, we're uh, trying to buy furniture and kind of setting up things. And at, at best, we were given maybe 4 to 5%. And it, it was a struggle to do that. But, you know, the Lord kind of put on our hearts that we had to make some changes. And so if, if we were going to be leaders within the church and, and have credibility and integrity and in, in, in what we thought Scripture was telling us, that we had to make some changes. We did that over a course of about a year, year and a half, to where we could get up to 10%. And, and things were going fine until year seven. And year seven is when Maggie arrived on the scene, along with a lot of doctor's bills and infertility bills that we still had to pay and 
we also made a decision for, for Jill to stay home with Maggie. And so we went from uh, two paychecks and two mouths to feed to three mouths to feed with one paycheck. And so all this was kind of this perfect storm. And so it, it caused us to really sit around the, the kitchen table with an adding machine and try to work through some things. And it was very hard for us. And the easy thing would have been to make up some of her lost income by backing off on what we were giving. And that would have been easy. Instead, we, we made the decision to get rid of my car. It was a 52 MG that my dad and I had been working on for four years when I was in high school. Drove it all the way through college and in my young adult uh, years, it, it was bright red. You couldn't tell because I had black and white film in the camera at the time. A tan leather mahogany dashboard. It was a sweet ride. It really was. Sometimes I miss it. But it made me, uh, you know, really think about some things. But he and I, I called him up and we took one last ride in the car. And then I put an ad in the paper and it was gone the next day. I thought, well, may, maybe, you know, it, it, it'll take a while. No, it was sold just that next day. But it, it, was, it was a decision that made sense for us. Not just because Jill and I were moving into the next phase of our lives, but we wanted to communicate to ourselves and to our family and to everyone else that nothing in this world holds sway over us like our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so this was a tangible way for us to express that. You know, um, what I'm proposing, you know, talking about tithing, I know it can be scary. I, I know it can. And I, I'd, I'd like to kind of read kind of a testimony of sorts this is from uh, Donald Miller, a book that came out a few years ago called Blue Light Jazz, where he talks about some of um, his thoughts as he was going through this. And I just want to read a couple pages of this because I think it, it illustrates what a lot of us begin to think. I met with Rick, that's his preacher, after he confessed I was not giving money to Imago Day. Rick had come over to the house and we were lying about how much we could bench press. And then I just blurted it out. Rick, I'm not giving any money to the church, not a dime. Okay, he said, interesting way to change the conversation. Why, he asked, why aren't you giving any money to the church? He said, because I don't have any money. Everything goes to rent and groceries. Well, this sounds like a tough situation. Now, he, he's in his 20s. He's, he's a young writer. He's very, he said very compassionately. So I'm exempt, I ask? Nope, we want your cash. Well, how much, I ask? He says, well, how much do you make? I don't know, about a thousand a month, maybe. Then we want a hundred. And you should also know how much you make. Part of the benefit of giving a portion of your money is it makes you think about where your money goes. God doesn't want us to be sloppy with our finances, Don. But I need money for rent. You also need to trust God. I, I know, I, I just think it'd be easier to trust God if I had extra money to trust him with. He said, well, well that wouldn't be faith then, would it? no. Well, Bud, I, I just want you to know, I hate this part of my job because it sounds like I'm asking you for money. I don't care whether or not we have your money. Our needs are met, and I want to tell you that, we, that you are missing out on so much, Don. So much what? The first fruits of obedience, he said, looking very pastoral. When we do what God wants us to do, we are blessed and we're spiritually healthy. God wants us to give a portion of our money to his work on earth. By setting aside money from every check, you're trusting God to provide. He wants you to get over that fear, that fear of trusting Him. It's a scary place, but that is where you have to go as a follower of Christ. The next week, I emptied my checking account, which had about $8 in it, and I gave it to the church. Another check came a few days later, and I gave 10% of that to the church. And then I got another writing gig with a magazine in Atlanta, and I deposited that check into my account, and I wrote a check to the church. One after another, I started getting called to speak at retreats and conferences that usually pay, pay pretty well. And each time I'd write a check to the church, since then, since that conversation with Rick, I've given at least 10% of every dollar I make. And I've never not had money for rent. For more than a year, my checking account had hovered or dipped just over or just under zero. And suddenly I had money to spare. I decided I would not open a savings account and that I would open a savings account in case someday I'd get married and have a family. And with each bit of money that came in, I'd give 10% to the church and 10% in the savings account. 
I was actually budgeting money, and I had never done that before. But that's not the best part. The best part is what tithing has done for my relationship with God. Before, I felt like I was always going to God with my fingers crossed, the way a child feels around his father when he knows he has told a terrible lie. God knew where I was. He didn't love me any different when I was holding out on him. It's just that I didn't feel clean around him, and you know how that can affect things. So hopefully, you resonate with part of that. But see, it, it isn't about giving, what, giving God what he needs. It, this is about us. It's about the condition of our heart. Uh, God doesn't ask us to give because he needs it or because we need it. it it's, it's in reality, he needs your heart, and, and he needs us to be dependent upon him. And we need to give to him at a meaningful level. And this is about our relationship with God. It's about trusting God like, like we say that, that we do. But it truly is putting that faith into motion. What am I calling us to do? Well, whether you're single or you're married with a house full of kids or you're empty nesters, I, I'm encouraging you to spend a little time around the kitchen table. Have some of those conversations. And it may just be a conversation with you and your adding machine. But spend some time this week. Figure out where your money is, is going. And also decide where you would like for your money to go. If giving to the Lord is, is a new thing, I, I really don't want you to be derailed about this whole tithe thing that, well, I, I can't give anything until I can give a tithe. No, pick a percentage and start there. The point is to learn to trust God financially and percentage giving is a way of doing that if you decide this is the level that that we want to give out make a commitment to that and start there because when we allow God to get involved in our our personal finances it can't help but increase our our faith as his disciples so I encourage you to do that then see how, how God begins to change your life I, I'm not promising you someone's going to give you a Cadillac or, or anything like that what I am promising is that the more that we give to the Lord, the more that we open ourselves up, he promises he's going to bless us. He's going to take that scoop, whatever size that we choose to hold out in our hand. He's going to fill it up. He's going to ask us to shake it. He's going to press it down. And he's going to ask us to lift up our, our shirt and just keep dumping more because that's the way God is. And that's the way, what he has promised for us. For the measure we use, it will be measured to you. I'm just going to challenge you. God says to, to challenge him. He says to test him, to put it out there. There's no better way to start. I'm just going to encourage you to try tithing for a month. Decide, this is a month that we're going to do it, and we're going to see what happens. Not just within your, your bank account, but see what happens within your heart. See what happens as your family has that conversation. Because this is not about paying off the note on a building. That, that's been taken care of. This is, this is a call to discipleship. It's a call for us to die to ourselves and start living in a more meaningful way as we respond to what God has done first in our lives.